a recording. <laughs> At least one of us is. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, don't, doctors. <laughs> don't expect a naughty boy. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Hi, Dom. Okay, before we do anything, did you enjoy the absolute A-game level of sound effects that I brought to last week's episode? You have no idea how many people reached out to me and said <laughs> that took me back to my youth. It was amazing. I was so, so impressed. <laughs> I spent so long. I know it may not seem but based on the quality of the sound effects, <laughs> but comedic timing is everything with sound effects, and it's oh, yeah. actually harder, I think, to do it in a comedy setting than in a scary setting. Absolutely, it's like know, composing music. a an or you know a piece of music. That's what it's mm. like. It's budum tish. It's not tish budum. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. That's I'll, our fact. I'll put one. I'll put an actual one in the sound effects. Just for could that. you please, please put a budum tish. <laughs> <laughs> the little clip clop of the heels yeah. was my favourite bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness me! Okay. I love it. Well, hi everybody. Um, as you can probably tell, uh, Kate and I are a little bit different. <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> well, in so many ways where to begin but <laughs> the big pod network but let us first just welcome you to part six of the big pod network's halloween special on the bridgewater series absolutely Ooh. Ooh, welcome people that haven't heard us before <laughs> <laughs> Kate, are you excited? I'm so excited. I really am. This is great. I'm just, again, I know I said it in one of our last episodes, and for our new listeners, you've got 50 episodes to catch up on to get to know us a little bit. Uh, you know, episode 50 we just did, and that was, a you know, you can get to know us really well because it was our Milestone Madness episode and we talk about each other a little bit and how we got to know each other. So that's a good one to start with, but then you should go back and have a look through some of our other episodes. However, this Boo Pod Network, it just keeps on getting better. The stories are just incredible. You can find on our socials, on the socials for the Nightcap podcast, Haunted UK, The Skylark Bell, Mummy's Murders and Mysteries. We have got four eps already and we've got our episode today. It's just a time. Mm -hmm. It sure is. And the latest episode, if you've missed out, was from Spilling the Crime, which was released just yesterday. Oh, so my gosh. We're ahead of time. Loaded. I know. Mm -hmm. We're ahead of time. So it miss, I totally missed that one. Sorry. But there's so much to catch up on. It's so thrilling. I just yeah. quick, did quick maths in my head too and I was like, hang on, I said four. We're number six. I don't think I mathsed very good there. <laughs> Thanks for catching me. Uh, insert calculator sounds. <laughs> ticka, 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 ticka. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know you're all frothing at the mouth, spitting chips, um, whatever. Pissing other... rings. Yeah. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you're pissing rings, please see your local doctor immediately. Yes. Absolutely. And don't pick up any hitchhikers on the way. <clears throat> oh, God, no. But before we get started into this week's Taunton State Hospital story, which is just disturbing on all sorts of levels, we do have a bit of housekeeping. Housekeeping. Ding, ling, ling. <laughs> so just a reminder for all of our listeners, but a lot of new folk are here today. Kate and I have a Shitting Bricks Patreon account. Just search for it. It's very easy to find. And for a very small monthly fee, you can become one of our very famous Brickies. Mm -hmm. There's three different tiers. A little bit of money goes a long way for Kate and I to keep the lights running and for our dreams to be kept alive, both good and scary ones. Correct. So go find that. Obviously, you know why you're all here because of the Boo Pod Network Halloween special. So I don't need to tell you more about it. But we're part six, and there's still two more parts to go after us. So make sure to tune into that. And last but not least, Kate, our Boo Pod Network 
podcast feature for this week is Mums, Mysteries and Murders. Ooh. Marty and Effie are hilarious. I oh love gosh. them. They're so, so funny. Fun much. They so did funny. A, yeah, they did such an amazing job with their Bridgewater series ep as well. So if you haven't already, folks, please go check them out. And here is their trailer. Boopity boop. boop. <laughs> oh, they're so great. Their voices crack me up. Kate, every time we do it, I don't know why. It's just the joke that never gets told. It, we love it. Again, for those new to us, we just entertain each other. That's really why we do this. But I hopefully you can get some chuckles out of it also. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, time has come, Kate. Let's yes. rip the proverbial Band-Aid off, get scared, and tell the tale of the Taunton State Hospital. Let's do it. Ooh. Kate hey, and I are going to share this story. I was, yeah, that. I was about to say, can you start us off and then I'll do a bit and then you do a bit? Okay, let's do that. Deal. <sighs> okay, so if you haven't checked out our socials <clears throat> this week, you may not realise, but there is an all-encompassing list of the top 10 scariest hospitals and asylums in the world. And... Taunton State Hospital is officially ranked number two. Deuces. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs> she deuces. So already the Bridgewater series, as you should know by now, the, the sheer amount of spooky, scary, you know, phenomenon that have been has been occurring. In this triangle. Oh right. Yeah. It's like Bermuda Triangle. Who? Yeah. Yeah. Can we Please see take us a seat. <laughs> Sit down, Bermuda. Nobody invited you. We're here to talk to Bridgewater. A She's couple of lost tits. boats. <laughs> she Give me is a break. The tits. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, for the fact that the second scariest or most haunted hospital slash asylum is located within the Bridgewater series, I mean, we should not be surprised. And I just thought we should start there. This there's some seriously scary shit that's happened at this place. I want to hear about it. Yeah, I before, demand. <laughs> before I get into the history of it, Kate. Okay. A um, couple of things. We're going to tell a couple of stories today, but also it's very difficult. I found it very challenging finding firsthand accounts from the people that either worked there or people that actually, you know, even harder to find people that stayed there. So yeah. I mean, once you get into it, it is. And once you get into the history too and start talking dates, you know, social media, not a particularly big thing at the time. <laughs> CNN, NBC probably weren't quite started at this stage. So, you know, you'll you'll know why. Yeah, Paris Hilton wasn't doing tiki tockies from herself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ding tongs, imagine that. Imagine simple life being filled in Taunton State Hospital. I'd pay good money, actually. <laughs> I'd actually that. want to see that. <laughs> I wouldn't let them out. But anyway. All right, folks. History of Taunton State Hospital. It is a psychiatric hospital located on Hodges Avenue in Taunton, Massachusetts. It was established in 1854, and it was originally known as the State Lunatic Hospital at Taunton. Mm, good title. Great title. Totally not a PC title. No. Nope. <laughs> for a little bit of, you know, just English checking out there for folks. Lunatic is a great word, though. It if is you called great... someone a lunatic in a derogatory sense, which I don't think that there's another way you could use it, but <laughs> what a great word. You lunatic. <laughs> it's a great word to say. Yeah. Lunatic. Yeah. Actually, let's... <laughs> Let's do a bit of research and find out where the hell the word lunatic came from. Is this oh, my God. You read, I'll type. Okay. Anyway, so it was the second state asylum in Massachusetts. Most of the original part of the facility was built in a really unique and rare neoclassical style designed by architects Boyden and Ball. FYI, Kate, if you ever imagine you know, picture in your mind the stereotypical sort of 
not middle America, but just old timey design of what, you know, um, buildings look like, like churches and mm -hmm. um, town halls and libraries and stuff like that. This is whenever you see a movie like National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, the godsend he is, <laughs> we're talking this timey type style of structure. Like it's it's classic. You know exactly what it looks like. It is also a Kirkbride plan hospital and it is located on a large 154 acre, which is 62 hectares, farm along the Mill River. Any updates on Lunatic? I do. Kate? Yes, I've got it. Yeah, I didn't want to yeah, I didn't want to jump in. Jump. I'm jumping. Jump. Lunatic. Oh my, oh, my lunatic. Uh late 13th century. Uh lunatic was affected with periodic insanity dependent on the changes of the moon. So back in the 13th century, they believed that the moon would uh, cause temporary insanity. It is from the old French lunatic, means insane, or directly from Latin lunaticus, uh, which is moonstruck. Um, so Latin <laughs> luna is moon. So it's all around the bloody lunatics of the moon. How about that? Luna took us. My Luna took us is flaring. <laughs> oh, so there Lord we it. go. Thanks for the education piece. You're welcome. Teach we always cake. teach people. You're welcome. Okay, back to it. The complex was expanded at various times to include over 40 buildings and structures. The main part of the hospital, known as the Kirkbride Building, closed in 1975 and the buildings fell into disrepair. In 1994, the property was added to the National Register of Historic Places as a historic district, and in 1999, the main dome of the administration building completely collapsed. In 2006, a large part of the historic complex was destroyed by fire, and in 2009, the remaining parts were demolished. However, many of the newer buildings on the campus remain. So it's a bit of a Frankenstein of a place. Yeah. Over New 40 and old. Mm. I find that fascinating, though, that it, it sort of officially closed in 1975. Yeah. Quite a while ago. Mm. Mm. Okay. History. Let's go a bit deeper, shall we? Let's do it. I'm ready. In 1851, the Massachusetts General Court <coughs> appointed a commission to find a site for a new asylum to relieve the pressure of a rising patient population from its only facility in Worcester. The new facility at Taunton opened on April 1854. The large sprawling campus located on a hill offered fresh air and sunlight following Kirkbride's concept for treating mental health patients. The complex was expanded in the early 1870s and again between 1887 and 1906. From the 1930s, juvenile facilities, crisis centres, sick wards and group homes were added. One of the building's most beautiful features was its breezeways, which were added in the 1890s to connect the end of the wards to the hospital's infirmary buildings. Its dis distinct cupolas, large dome, cast iron capitals and window bar gave this building its very own unusual personality. Mm, just what you need somewhere mm. where there's, you know, creepy stuff happening. Right. It's just it was like made for it. Yeah. In 1975, the main part of the hospital was closed and abandoned. In 1999, the large dome towering over the hospital's administration building collapsed. Then, on the night of March, 9th, March 19th, 2006, a massive fire broke out in the centre of the building, which included the administration and the theatre. Mm. Sections damaged by fire were then levelled, leaving only the decaying wings of the Kirkbride building. So even if there was anything left in the administration building, which I'm sure that there wasn't, but even if there was any scraps of information or anything like that, no doubt were destroyed beyond repair. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously <laughs> destroyed kind of caps that. But, yeah. It was poetic right up until yeah, then. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I was really trying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's almost like something supernatural was trying to just... 
bust this joint down. Yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> All right. In May 2009, demolition of the remaining historic sections of the Kirkbride building began. The facility had numerous architectural features that were salvaged and sold to individuals and companies throughout the United States, including architectural granite, bricks, timbers, iron gates, vintage plumbing and mm. lighting fixtures, even furniture and slate roofing tiles. And the project was completed in early 2010. Mm. So how creepy is this thought, Kate, that there could be pieces of this haunted hospital spread out all across the United States and Surely. you wouldn't even know it? Yeah. Mm. Now let's get to the spooky stuff, shall we? Yes, please. Now rumours choke the area, stating that while the original hospital was in operation, a notorious satanic cult in the area operated it. Oh. It is said they would take patients into the basement to conduct dark rituals and even human sacrifices. That's bad juju. Yeah. That's a bad vibe. Bad hospital practice, by the yeah. way. Oh, yes, also that. <laughs> now, today there are still strange and unexplained markings on the walls of the basements. And while the hospital was still open, staff would attempt to go downstairs into the basement area only to be stopped by a force once their foot reached the bottom step. Ooh. Mm. Another commonly reported happening are the ghastly disembodied screams that echo from the hospital grounds. Blood-curdling, horrifying screams they are, it's been told. Cries for help and sobbing are also heard when moving about the hospital. These hauntings have even seeped into the surrounding woods. The entire campus is deemed haunted. Taunton State Hospital is even referred to as America's most haunted asylum and that the devil himself checked in there. Ooh, maybe it was the devil at the bottom of the step just mm -hmm. going, no, nope, not today, I'm busy. Come back later. I'm haunting things. Thanks for coming. It's like when someone's in the stalls in the bathroom and it's like, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Occupied. I'm in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's story pooping. <laughs> so what's been a real challenge, Kate, and I've spent legitimately hours trying to find, you know, you know me, I'm a very big sceptic of these things. Yes. Sorry to rain on people's parades, but I am. Doesn't mean I don't want to believe it. I'm just critical of it. Yeah. Trying to find, you know, actual accounts of specific people or their, you know, experiences was really difficult for this hospital. There's lots of people talking very generally about, you know, certain occurrences, but finding actual accounts was really, really hard. So... Before we get on to the rest of the story, we did find, obviously, a fair bit of information of some of the people that did stay there. So mm -hmm. we're going to tell some of their stories in a moment. But there was a bit of controversial evidence, uh, not evidence, but some misunderstanding about what the recent history of the building is and whether is it still open, is it closed, like what's going on. So this is the latest that I've been able to find. In the early 1990s, a 19 million capital improvement plan was implemented by the state to improve the still operating portions of the campus. In early 2012, the state announced the closure of the remaining parts of the facility con containing 169 beds, but a plan to keep a portion of the facility open was vetoed by the then Governor Deval Patrick in July 2012. Now, Torn State Hospital does remain open and houses 48 psychiatric beds. There's also the Women's Recovery from Addiction Program, a residential program under the Department of Youth Services, and a substance abuse program administered by High Point Treatment Centre. There is also a greenhouse on the campus that is staffed by patients and sells a variety of plants and seasonal produce to the public. I do not want those strawberries. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> the devil's in these straws. 
so it was a bit i think because there's so many different buildings and it's like it's been destroyed it's been rebuilt it's had yeah. funding and all of it's, and then some of it's been vetoed blah 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 it's a bit confusing and because you know can't just pop in the old volvo and draw it down <laughs> <laughs> Not at the moment, at least. Um, would love if any of our listeners or anyone that is from Massachusetts and can, like, reconfirm whether my info is accurate, the fact that there might be parts of this place still open, that actually scares the shit out of me yeah. even more. Uh, so, Kate. Agreed. Yes. How about you tell us probably about the most famous person ever to visit? Um, Taunton Taunton State. State Hospital. I would love to. I'm going to tell you a story about my friend Jane. She's not really my friend. Um, <laughs> and probably not someone to have hung out with, I would say. You can make your own choice after I've told you a little bit about Jane. Please now, do. Jane Topan. Topan, oh, I spoke about this before. I said, how would you say it? And I just wrecked it in the first go. Uh, Jane Toppen, she was born March 31st, 1854. So we're going back a little ways when I was in primary school. And she died on August 17th, 1938. So she lived for a little while. Now, she was born Honora Kelly, and she was an American serial killer, nicknamed Jolly Jane. <laughs> I love that. Right? The same, but why like this happy little, you know, children's birthday entertainer name, you know, anyway. Would you hire Jolly Jane? Jolly Jane, coming to your party soon. Uh, she was arrested in 1901 and she confessed to 31 murders, but only 12 of those were actually confirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, Toppen is quoted as saying that her ambition was to have killed more people helpless people than any other man or woman who ever lived. You know what? I always say you've got to have a goal. <laughs> I don't know that that is the right kind of goal, but it seemed that she had one. So she gave it a red hot. Um, I don't know. Now, Toppen, she worked as a nurse from around 1885 to 1902, and her victims consisted of her patients and their family members. Ugh. This has got a cute little, like, misery vibe, uh, <laughs> which I love. Now, let me tell you a little bit about her early life. We always say in all of our pods there's usually traumas. It doesn't excuse behaviour, but let's hear a little bit about Jane. Now, Jane was the daughter of Irish immigrants. Her mum, Bridget Kelly, died of tuberculosis when she was very young. And her father, Peter Kelly, shout mm. out to my year 12 media teacher, Peter Kelly, not the <laughs> same one, but <laughs> now he was really well known as an eccentric and he was an abusive, abusive alcoholic. He was nicknamed by those who knew him as Kelly the Crack, as in Crackpot. <laughs> I like that. Three nicknames. I love it. Now, in later years, Peter Kelly was said to have sewn his own eyelids closed whilst working as a tailor. Oof. Gross. That's Stay away commitment. From guys. Yeah. In 1860, only a few years after his wife's death, Kelly took his two youngest children, eight year old daughter Delilah Josephine and six year old Jane, to the Boston Female Asylum. Now, this was an orphanage for indignant female children. What, that, I'm sure that was a thrill of a place to be. Uh, now, Kelly surrendered the two girls, never to see them again. I mean, mm -hmm. at this point, he has not sewn his eyes together, one would assume, but probably, you know, maybe better off. I don't know. The, you know, equal evils. <clears throat> okay. Now, documents from the asylum note that they were rescued from a very miserable home, inverted commas. No records exist of Delilah and Jane's experiences during their time in the asylum, but reportedly uh, Delia, did I say Delilah before? I feel yeah, like I did. Okay. Look, Delia, she is reported to have become a prostitute, um, while their older sister, Nellie, who was not committed to the orphanage, she was committed to an insane asylum anyhow. So it seems they're doing really well, the sissies, um, committing to some, you know, certain activities that might not have been the best. 
Now, in November 1862, less than two years after being abandoned by their father, uh, Jane was placed in an, as an indentured servant in the home of Mrs. Anne C. Toppin of Lowell, Massachusetts. Though never, formal, never formally adopted by the Toppins, uh, Jane took on that surname um, and then eventually became known as Toppin. The original Toppin family already had a daughter. Her name was Elizabeth, and Jane was uh, friends with her. That's cool. She was. I like, have yeah, a you're question. Right. Okay. Hit me. Was there ever like a hospital for indignant boys? I mean, this father sewed his eyelids shut. Why are the children going to hospital and right and things like that when clearly this man? Oh, I just tell you, I'm sorry. I Look. just. I have a really um, strong vibe and I'm going to use one of my least favourite sayings, but I think 1800s to the early 1900s was very much a boys being boys type of environment. Um, boys being boys, just Ugh. from a personal standpoint, is not an excuse for being an asshole. Just letting you know, I'm just putting that out there. Uh, so I would suggest that that's probably why there was not a hospital for, you know, indignant boys because they were just being how boys should be. <laughs> mm. All right. Now, do you want me to tell you a little bit about Jane's murders? Yes, please. In 1885, Toppen began training to be a nurse at Cambridge Hospital. Unlike her early years where she was described as brilliant and terrible, cool. Um, at the hospital, she was well-liked, she was bright, and she was friendly. So that's where she got her nickname, Jolly Jane. Once Toppen became close with the patients, she picked her favourite ones. The patients were normally elderly and very sick. During her residency, Toppen used her patients as guinea pigs in experiments with morphine and atrophine. She altered their prescribed dosages to see what it did to their nervous system. Oh. That's not okay. However, she spent considerable time alone with the patients, making up fake charts and medicating them to drift in and out of consciousness and even getting into bed with them. Dull. Okay. Don't. Toppin was recommended for the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital in 1889. There she claimed several more victims before being fired the following year. No doubt. She briefly returned to Cambridge but was soon dismissed for administering opiates recklessly. Toppen then began a career as a private nurse and flourished despite complaints of petty theft. So she's got a bit of a streak, this one. She's not I into know. being a good girl. She should yeah. take up, like, join your local knitting club or something, girl. Yeah, Get yourself come on. busy. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Sorry, my uh, I have a thing happening. Uh, Toppen began her poisoning spree in earnest in 1895 by killing her landlord, Israel Dunham, and his wife. In 1899, she killed her foster sister, Elizabeth, with a dose of strychnine. Oh, goodness. Poor Elizabeth. I thought they were friends. Yeah. Oh. Now, in 1901, Toppen moved in with the elderly Eldon Davis and his family, family um, in Catchumet. That's how I'm going to sell that. Is that, would you say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, she, uh, you know, was there to take care of him after the death of his wife, Matty, but Toppen had also murdered her. So mm -hmm. he's like, oh, God, my wife died. And she's like, I know, weird, right? I wouldn't know anything about that apart from <laughs> doing it. Now, within weeks, she killed Davis, his sister, Edna, and two of his daughters, Minnie and Genevieve. So she's just on one. She's like, Where's my syringe? Got to, you know, <laughs> pop another victim in the ground. Boop. Could just see her walking along with a little case of jingle jangling, rattling. Yeah, a little <laughs> old school medical pile. case. Yeah, that's right. Here comes Jolly J. <laughs> jingle, jingle, jingle <laughs> with her party favours. Now, the surviving members of the Davis family, they ordered a toxicology exam on Alden Davis, um, on Alden Davis's youngest daughter, Minnie, and the report found, surprise, surprise, she'd been poisoned and the local authorities assigned a police detail on Toppen to watch her. On October 29th, 1901, she was arrested for murder. By 1902, she had confessed to 31 murders. Mm. So they would have been like, hey, we, you're under arrest for the murder of Minnie Davis. And she's like, yeah, what about the other 30 people? <laughs> They'd be like, huh? 
come on in, have a chat, talk to us about these victims. Now, soon after the trial, one of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers, the New York Journal, printed what was purported to be Toppin's confession to her lawyer, claiming that she had killed more than 31 people and that she wanted the jury to find her sane so she could eventually have a chance at being released. Uh, Yeah, good one. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Now, Toppin insisted upon her own sanity in court, claiming that she could not be insane if she knew what she was doing and she knew that it was wrong. But nonetheless, she was declared insane and she was committed. On June 23rd, 1902, in the Barnstable County Courthouse, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed for life to the Taunton Insane Hospital. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, how many of these true crime stories have we either told or listened to, Kate? (laughs) And the defendant is actually Yeah, they're like, I am not crazy. (laughs) I did it. I can tell you how I did it. I was not mad. I just want to go to prison. Maybe let's just make it, let's call it three years, okay? (laughs) Let's just do a year for every 10 victims and then I'll pop out of hospital and then obviously can I go back to work as a nurse? I assume I can just go back to being a nurse, right? Is that how it happens? Because I'm not insane. I just (laughs) kill people. Oh, my glory be. I mean, obviously going into a hospital back then is not a great thing and being committed for life. Sure, it's probably yeah. the worst worst choice out of the two, but my goodness, like, yeah, that's exactly. not common. Now, let me give you um, a little list of the victims that were identified. And more interestingly, I found their ages. You know, we were talking she's, uh, you know, she preyed on older victims. Uh, so yeah. victims that Toppen identified are Israel Dunham, her landlord, uh, I believe. Was that? Yeah, that was that. Um, aged 83. Lovely Dunham, aged 87. Elizabeth Brigham, her foster sister, she was 70. Mm. So, you know, I was thinking of these, I was just like, hang on, that her sister, that's like, she'd be like 20s? No, she was 70. Uh, Mary McNear, she was a patient, she was 70. Florence Culkins, housekeeper for Elizabeth, she was 45. So a little spring chick. Uh, William Ingram, a patient, age 70. Oh, she's got a fan of the 70s. Uh, Sarah or Myra Connors, she was a patient and friend, age 48. Maddie Davis, the wife of Alden Davis, she was 62. Uh, Genevieve Gordon, that was the daughter of Alden and Maddie. And it uh, doesn't have her age there, but she was she died in 1901. Alden Davis was 64. Minnie Gibbs. Uh, the daughter, another daughter as well, she was 40, and Edna Bannister, the sister-in-law of Elizabeth, she was 77. So those Mm. are the ones that she, you know, identified, but she's claimed there's 31. That's a lot. Uh, But, I mean, even that list. One person is too many to murder, to be honest. Yeah, like we haven't done very many stories of people with that high, high a head count. Yeah. (laughs) It's just... And you know what? I think I get, I'm a little bit sensitive of how the elderly are treated. Like Mm. nothing gets me going more than the mistreatment of people that are sick and elderly. Yeah, and vulnerable. Obviously murder's wrong no matter what, but Mm. just these helpless people deserve so much better and it's just, yeah, it's horrid. Agreed. Um, Now, let me tell you a little of her motives behind it, because obviously after she's arrested and she's put in Taunton State, uh, she would talk a little about, you know, this is why I did it or this was something I enjoyed in Mm. my spree. So an article in the Hoosier State Chronicles published shortly after Toppin's arrest reported that she would fondle her victims as they died and attempt to see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. So perhaps that's why she climbed into bed so she could just turn their head and stare into their eyeballs. Um, Under questioning, Toppin stated that she derived a sexual thrill from patients being near death, coming back to life and then dying again. So Toppin would administer a drug mixture to the patients, uh, you know, that she chose as victims. She would lay with them and hold them close as they died. 
Toppin is often considered an angel of mercy, a type of serial killer who takes on a caretaker role and attacks the vulnerable and dependent, though she also murdered for seemingly more personal reasons, such as the case of the Davis family, where she mm. was just like, nah, you're all gone. It's possible that Toppin was also motivated by jealousy in the case of the murder of her foster sister. She later described her motivation as a paralysis of thought and reason with a strong urge to poison. Golly. That's actually a really good description and sentence. Like, I, you know. A paralysis talking... of thought. Yeah. 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 I have and those reason. sometimes. Yeah. I will say things at work and I'm like, oh, golly, that was another paralysis of thought. I <laughs> 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 hope I get my job on Monday. <laughs> Now, Toppin used poison for more than just one murder, reportedly poisoning a housekeeper um, just enough so that she appeared drunk in order to steal her job and kill the family. Cool. She even poisoned herself to evoke sympathy of men who courted her. So she's like, good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. Oh, I'm going to get in on this party. <laughs> I'm poisoned. Feel sorry for me. I'm afraid with a resume such as that, Jane, I do not feel sorry for you. And I hope that your stay at Taunton State was a real thrill. Talk about an evil place for evil people to go to. Like, yeah. Do ooh. you feel like as well, because, you know, the people that are working there are other people that were residents of the Taunton State. Do you feel like she would have gone, guys, I have a really good set of skills that would actually go down a treat here. I can poison some motherfuckers and I am really yeah. good at it. I've done it heaps. Come on in. We'll go down to the cafeteria, give each other all a bit of poison. Let's just have a time. Go to Jolly Jane's bar. Yeah. Double shot of strychnine. Chinko, 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 chinko. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dom, that's the really, you know, um, sort of wrapped up version of Jolly Jane, who was one of the horrendous uh, patients, victims, people. No, she's not a victim. She's a person who went there because she did awful things. But I wondered if you've got another story of someone else who resided at the yes. hospital. <laughs> Delay. I love it. I was just thinking. I'm like, I think I ended that sentence, but then I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike our uh, colleagues in the Boot Pod Network who are really good at, you know, their storytelling skills are really based on, you know, drawing things out and, yeah. and speaking slowly. In Australia, we it's, can't speak fast enough. Oh, my God, it's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Like, please, the more information we can cram into this, the more we can confuse you with our fast talking and our slang and our terms. Bring it on. Yeah. I mean, one last thing on Jane. I'm just... Imagine how horrid and scary it might be if she actually had been practising at the hospital and yeah. causing all of this, you know, mayhem and, and murder. Yeah. It's giving me very, you know, either American Horror Story Asylum series and uh, Ratchet, Ratcheted, Ratcheted? Yeah, Nurse Ratchet. Yeah. Nurse Ratchet. Absolutely. But, yes, Kate, Jane was not the only person that... Uh, that spent some time at Taunton State Hospital. There is another person named Anthony Santo. And because he's from Italy, I thought I would tell the story. I love it so much. And can I tell you something as well? My type is uh, like Italian. It's mm. just if they've got Italian in their family, Italian American, ideally, but you know, I live in Australia, so it's hard to find. Um, my last series of boyfriends all looked the same. They were just a different version of the other person <laughs> I found. So I think I would have liked this guy <laughs> just because of his name. <laughs> well, let's see how you go at the okay. end. Okay. All right. We'll see if I'm still keen to, you know, swipe right. We'll see how you sure. Go. Yeah, that'll be the test. Now, Anthony Santo, he was born in 1894 in Italy and the date of his death is unknown, Kate. Ooh, so mm. there's still a chance. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you're in for a chance. <laughs> he would now, only be, what, is it 1894 plus, two, like, what's the difference? He's a heart, he's 200, he's old. He's old. He's old. Okay. <laughs> Sugar daddy. <laughs> Woo. Now, he was an Italian-American man who confessed to murdering two of his cousins 
and another girl in the span of three months during what he described as mad spells. Ooh. He was eventually diagnosed as having hallucinations and sent to Taunton Lunatic Asylum where he supposedly died. Oh. Now, not much is known about Santo's life prior to his immigration to America, but it is known that he was born in 1894 in Italy. That's it. That's all we know. Sometime prior to the murders, though, he had begun showing signs of mental illness. His parents claimed that he contracted scarlet fever when he was around six years old and that his mind had been afflicted since that time. Mm. It's got me a little concerned because, as I believe we've discussed previously, I have also had scarlet <laughs> fever. <laughs> that would explain some things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my mind has always been a little bit disturbed. <laughs> yeah, ditto. And I didn't have scarlet fever. Oh, well. Go back <laughs> to the drawing board on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you're, just, you're just a lunatic. No worries. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, on June 6th, 1908, Anthony Santo, at the age of 14, was apprehended and questioned regarding the theft of a bicycle. He confessed to murdering his two cousins, Frank and James Marino, ages 18 and 12 respectively in Brooklyn, as well as six-year-old Louise Stulia in Dedham. Could you imagine that if you are the police officer and you're like, hey, Tony, did you steal this bicycle? Uh, no, sir, I didn't, but I did kill my two cousins and a little six-year-old girl. Is that the same thing? You want the bike back? Hey, get some prosciutto. We got a satrialis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. It's so good. I just thought it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, the murders of Frank and James. According to Santos' confession, he led his two cousins on a long walk in the woods in Brooklyn near 6th Street. When the boys weren't looking, he threw large rocks at their heads. James was killed by the rocks, but Santo used a pocket knife to kill Frank after injuring him with the rocks. Santo claimed that he buried Frank's body in the woods but could not remember what he had become of James's body. He also could not recall an exact date, only that it was around March 1st, 1908. He was having a mad spell. <laughs> I mean, this little kid at the age of 14. Oh, my God. He sh The Sopranos should have recruited this little kid. Like, it sounds <laughs> yeah. like an episode. It really does. Like, Holy at moly. the age of 14, that's quite a young age, right? I don't think yeah. at the age of 14, really, most kids are fully understanding of their actions yeah, but also like for something fully. like the rocks, you know, I'm kind of like, sure. But then to pull out a pocket knife, like that is a real, that's an intent, that's an up close and personal, that's a visceral attack, like that's yeah. full on. It's very intimate. Yeah. Now, poor Louise, uh, about mm. a month before, before Louise Statula, Statula. Staula? Staula? Staula. Daula's death, Santo moved to East Boston where he lived with another cousin. He then uh -oh. began work as a waiter boy, helping with the construction of a sewer. Su sewer. Sewer. <laughs> <laughs> he started helping with the construction of a sewer. <laughs> okay. I'm having a bad spell, people. I'm having a bad spell. <laughs> you lunatic. In May 1908, the body of six-year-old Louise F. Staula was found in the Charles River Meadow, which was behind her house. Ten fist-sized rocks were found near the body. Five had bloodstains, and police theorised that she had been stoned to death based on her injuries. Holy moly. This rock and knife thing is really Ooh. specific. Yeah, it's full on. 
All right. Now, on June six, Santo was apprehended for bicycle theft and confessed mm -hmm. to the murder, as well as that of his two cousins. Now, Santo claims that on May eleventh, while in Dedham, he chanced upon six-year-old Louise. In that moment, he claimed to experience a mad spell and struck the girl once before picking up a rock and throwing it at her while she tried to escape. Louise was struck on the head and fell on the ground. Thinking she was dead, Santo began praying for her so he could make her get better. Oh, my God. Louise hadn't died yet, but without any help, she eventually died from her injuries. Anthony stayed with the body for a while before deciding to leave her in the open field and flee. Oh, that's awful. Mm -hmm. Now, Santo was captured in Norwood. He was caught trying to steal a bike, as we know. After an examination and trial, police chief Fred S. Sackett and a few reporters were interviewing the boy when he announced that he had something important to tell them. He then confessed to the murders of his two cousins. The policeman immediately detained the alleged murderer until an investigation could be conducted. And while being interrogated regarding his earlier confession, Santo also told the investigators that he had murdered Louise. <clears throat> now, police records in Brooklyn did not support Santo's confession. No boys by the last name Marino had been reported missing around the time Santo claimed to have committed the murders. Santo indicated that his cousins lived at 461 Carroll Street, but other tenants could not confirm that anyone by the name Marino lived in the building in at least the last year. What? Despite his confession, the officers and doctors questioning him also determined that he was not connected with Louise's death. They claimed that he was feeble-minded and delusional, experiencing hallucinations. Shortly after, an order for his removal was issued by the authorities of Dedham and Santo was submitted to the Taunton Lunatic Asylum. It is assumed that he died there, but the date of death remains unknown. What? Bet you were not expecting no. that, folks. I was not. I thought he killed the people. Yeah. Damn. And the fact that there's no record or anything of his body or his death is, I just find that really particularly oh, spooky. Oh, that's creepy. Oh, yeah. And wild. What? So, yeah, Kate, that is the end of this week's episode of Taunton State Hospital. I wish that we had more to share, folks, but... There's a lot of questions yeah. left about this place and who was there, what was being done by the staff, what was happening in the basement, what happened to all these people, where where are their bodies, where are they buried, and all the lack of records and things like that. It's just it's quite a mystery in itself because every time I've read stories of other hospitals and asylums, there's a lot of evidence. There's a yeah. lot of stuff there. But the fact that so much is missing and this place has just had a lot of a lot of bad shit happen to it. Yeah. It's Ooh. to me, it's a bit of like a spooky black hole of it's an unsolved mystery. Unknown. So the burning question, Kate. Would you go on a date with Anthony Santo? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if he didn't murder them. That's a plus. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a picture. But wouldn't. other than that, you know, maybe a coffee. Avoid rock climbing? Yeah, I would. <laughs> avoid parks, lakes, anywhere that have some fist-sized rocks. <laughs> um, holy moly. I'd ch just check him, pat him down for pocket knives. Holy <laughs> free holes. Uh, so, look, yeah, yeah, look, I would, I'd have a coffee. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Ah, thank you, Dominic, for all the work you put in for this episode. I really enjoyed us doing a little taggy teamy. And I hope that our listeners, both new and old, have enjoyed our Bridgewater Triangle Bridgewater series episode as part of our Boopod Network month of spoopy. Yes. And 
On the 26th of October, Paranormal Exposed is going to launch part seven of the Bridgewater series. So please tune in there. Wait, eight? Are we're we seven? seven. No, we're six. Are we six? Oh, my God. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know how to do mathematics. We have established this. I got you covered, <laughs> Kate. Times. Thank you for being my calculator. <laughs> now, don't forget to check out our socials. Shitting Bricks podcast, we're on all of them. Check out our Patreon as well too. And tune in next week because it's Kate and I's Shitting Bricks birthday, exactly birthday. one year Woo! since we started Shitting Bricks. And we have some more funny, lighthearted, interestingly, birthday-themed stories to yes. tell. Yes. We look forward to seeing you, hearing you, listening then. Uh, whatever. Uh, we love you so much and we'll speak to you very soon. Bye. Bye. Love you. <laughs>